I'm very, very really pleased to be here. I appreciate y'all letting me come and talk. Um, pine straw and agroforestry is something that I have started working with a good bit since I've come to Auburn. I started out in my life, full disclosure, working for a warehouser company. I worked there for 13 years as a production forester on their lands in North Alabama and North Mississippi. Um, and so when the person asked earlier, does anybody know where Detroit, Alabama is, I waved my hand, I know, I've been to Detroit, Alabama. And the um, funny thing too, when I started working at Auburn, I did a, a program up in Winfield, Alabama. Some of y'all probably know where Winfield is. Um, and it was funny because when I did the program up there, they were like, because that was kind of my stomping ground, so I worked with Warehouser, and I said, um, you know, I came up to do that program, and they're like, Becky, you know, folks at Auburn, they don't care about Winfield, they don't know where Winfield is. I'm like, oh, you're so full of it. Yes, of course they know about Winfield. Have you? And they're like, no, Becky, really, they don't care about Winfield. They don't know where it is. I said, you know, that part of Alabama is really just, you know, lost. And so I go back to Auburn, and somebody said, oh, you know, you've been gone. Where have you been? I said, well, I had this program up in Winfield, Alabama. And they go, Winfield? Where's Winfield? I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> the guy was right all along. So, um, But I do spend a lot of time here at the Dixon Center. I teach um, forest measurements to our forestry students. Then our forestry students are down here for eight weeks. So I'm down here for three of those eight weeks. Um, it's always interesting when you have 25 to 30 Young men, ages 18 to 25, it's, it's never dull, let's just put it that way. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you all about pine straw. Um, and so a lot of times when we think about forestry, um, landowners right now are really trying to think of ways that they can make additional revenue off of their property. Um, and that can be in the form of you know, silver pasture as agroforestry, that's the cows and trees model. And actually we're going to have a, a short course down here next week, if anybody's interested, next weekend this time, on silver pasture and agroforestry. Um, but today I want to talk to you all a little bit more about forest farming. And forest farming is a type of agroforestry that people don't think about as much, especially here in the southeast. Um, the lower south, where we cultivate or collect specialty products. Um, that could be in the form of what we call at times non-timber forest products. And a lot of times when we think of those, we think of things that we can eat that come from the forest. And this is very, you know, bigger, more kind of into North Carolina, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. But a lot of times we may think about bee products. We may think about medicinals like black cohosh, things like that. Um, fruits, nuts, and edible flora, mushrooms, um, a lot of times when I talk about medicinal herbs, people kind of snicker. I'm like, no, that not that kind of medicinal herb. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of the things we a lot of times don't consider are the wild crafts or things that we don't eat, like pine cones, um, bark baskets, again, uh, fire stars and fatwood. You see advertisements around the holidays in L.L. Bean and Eddie Bauer for Georgia fatwood. It's essentially, I mean, and they sell it for exorbitant prices. And um, you can... That comes, a lot of it is longleaf pine, you know, stuff we have in our, um, our own backyards. Um, vines, cones, leaves, it's amazing how much these go for. And um, I've done talks on those too. Things that we have laying around in our forest that we could be making revenue off of. And, and then pine straw. And pine straw is what I'm going to talk to you all about today. Um, because a lot of times it's really important to, to think about harvesting these and how we can harvest them in a sustainable manner. Um, a lot of times we have these wild craft professionals or folks that actually make a lot of their income off of these harvests. Again, this is more kind of in um, the northern part of the south. Um, and they kind of travel around and they collect these different items. Um, and then we have folks that are usually like wild craft recreationists. And they actually harvest things for their own, you know, and a lot of y'all may fall into that category and didn't even realize it. You may use the pine cones or the things from your forest as gifts. Um, a lot of times the folks that are like you and me or just do this recreationally, we're a lot more connected to land managers. Um, the folks that actually do this for a living, they're really concerned about somebody coming in and rustling their whatever, their pine cones or whatever they're trying to collect. So a lot of times they don't talk to the foresters and the land managers very well. Folks like you and me, we're a lot better connected to the forest, to the forest management piece of it. I mean, want to do it responsibly. Um, again, so, you know, we've talked about those non-edible land and landscaping NTFPs, and so I want to talk to you again, like I said, kind of specifically about pine straw today. 
Um, and this is my pine straw baler that um, we were talking about earlier. I was going to bring it and I brought down, um, my kids are here running around and they got hurt. I got to come to the Dixon Center. They were like, we're coming with you. They come with me a lot of times in the summer. Um, so I got one of the university vehicles and I got a bigger one thinking I, that would fit better. No, that my pine straw baler fits better in an expedition than it does in a suburban. Um, so I didn't get to bring it with me, but um, pine straw is the needles that can be raked. Um, off of your forest land, they usually fall in the winter. Um, they're usually harvested in uh, fall in November, then they're harvested in December or January and sold to realistic retailers or landscapers who use it as a ground cover. And it can be raked by hand, as you can see here with my pine straw baler or with a box baler, or it can be machine raked. It happens a lot in Georgia, they use machine raking. Um, and usually it comes from longleaf slash or loblaw pines. That's the primary. Um, pines because those needles are long enough. We'll talk about kind of the benefits of the different ones, but that's usually um, the primary southern pines that it comes from. Um, and pine straw raking is not just a southern thing. It's interesting, I've seen some reports, you know, the Great Lakes states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, they realize what we've got happening here. And if you think about it, actually, pine straw is shipped from Florida, Georgia. It is shipped up into these states. And I've seen reports by the state forestry commissions that, uh, from these states that say, hey, you know what, we, need to, we know we're never going to be able to compete with the South when it comes to pine straw production. But we have red pines, and we have um, Norway pines, and we have eastern white pines that we can rake the pine straw off of and, and sell it. And so they're actually starting to look into this as well. <coughs> and it's not a new idea. I love this. This is um, W.R. Mattoon. He was a great extension forester. Um, in the 1930s, and he wrote this, Profits from Farm Woods, Money-Making Examples from Southern Farmers. And I love this, it says, Pine Straw Commercial Product. It says, A.B. Williams in Wade, North Carolina, makes regular income selling pine straw from his 10-acre patch of pines. He sells the straw on the ground at a rate of 25 cents per cartload, and as it, um, an acre produces three to five loads, his net income is from 75 cents to $1.25 per acre yearly. And this was in 1930. A farmer near Fayetteville, North Carolina, can make his chief living from raking his pine straw and selling it in town for $3 a load. And in the strawberry sections of the South, pine straw unraked on the ground brings from $2 an acre in North Carolina to $5 in Mississippi. But what were they using it for at that time? That's where he was talking about. They were using it actually like as a mulch in their ag crops. Oh, like their ag crops. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I mentioned that longleaf loblolly and slash pine are kind of the main ones. Uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about those different species. If you're from down here, you're very familiar with longleaf. Um, these pines are easily identified by their long 8 to 18 inch needles. You've seen some of the examples of those really long needles out in some of the exhibitor sites. Um, they really have these large pine cones. They're the biggest ones of kind of the southern pines. Found on a wide variety of soils. A lot of times people have the misconception that's just the dry rocky sites. Longleaf is a better competitor on these sites than some of the other southern pines, but it's not, you know, restricted to those. Um, it does well on sites that don't support higher quality oaks, and again, it can be found on drier sites with fire tolerant oaks. Slash pine has needles usually 5 to 11 inches long. Cones are kind of a browner, shinier, leathery look to them. Um, and then they occur, it naturally occurs within 150 miles of the coast. It used to be one of the most widely planted southern pines, um, but really, naturally, it should only, historically, only occur within 150 miles of the coast. And then loblaw pine, kind of the least desirable of the pine straw producing southern pines, have needles that are shorter, four to nine inches, kind of those prickly cones that when we were kids we used to throw at each other because um, it hurt. Um, usually on moist to well-drained sites, again, loblaw pine, as the name in, implies, it should be found on wetter areas and limited to no range on deeper sandy soils. So that's kind of the three primary southern pines that we have that are good pine straw producers and that are raked. And so if you think about pine straw here, we saw the thing about those cartloads of straw. That's what it might have looked like. If you think about the pine straw industry, you know, this is what it was back in the 30s and before then. It was really kind of 
not very well organized. And well, you can see things kind of hadn't changed very much today. Um, it's funny, I was actually coming from a meeting about pine straw and silver pasture, and we got behind this pickup truck with this pyramid of pine straw on it, and I just, I couldn't resist. I was like, oh my gosh. It is really this loose association of folks. Um, we have a lot of pine straw rustlers out there. And it's, uh, the industry chain is, is pretty loose still. Um, we're organized in some states like Georgia, where extensions really had a big presence in making things work. Um, Alabama, we're really behind and kind of trying, we're getting there, but we're behind. Um, but if you look at it, usually you have a landowner, and these prices are from 2007, have a landowner that may make 50 to 65 cents a bale. Um, they usually have some contract with a pine straw dealer. Um, the pine straw dealer then works for the forced labor contractor who may make a dollar to a dollar twenty a bale. Um, and then the pine straw harvester who makes 70 to 90 cents a bale. Again, these prices are for two, from 2007. So as a lander, you do have a lot of opportunities. If you're thinking about trying to get into the pine straw breaking business, this is a hard place to be right here. Um, we need to work with folks to be able to help make <coughs> this a better opportunity for them. Um, but as the landowner goes, you, you can make some money off of it. Um, when you think about the potential for pine straw, I look at Georgia. Like I said, our neighbor to the east has so much pine straw right that they report it as a separate forest commodity, which is nuts. <laughs> but you can see that in 2012, pine straw accounted for over 9% of their forest products market, um, $58.7 million. Here's a graph of it through time, and you can, I like to jokingly say this is about the time that I started getting into the talking about pine straw with Alabama's landowners, and you see there's dropped off, so I'm hoping that some of it came this way. <laughs> um, we are starting to get more people interested and more people thinking about raking pine straw, which is a good thing. You know, you see trucks from Florida and Georgia coming through the state of Alabama, and we have tons of pine straw that our landowners could be making money off of their property. Again, I think we're missing the boat when it comes to that. So what I want to talk to you briefly is a few things. I want to talk to you a little bit about a study that we did. I had a graduate student named Janice Dyer who did a really nice project looking at pine straw in Alabama. And what she did is she did she had a three-pronged project. She developed a pine straw yield estimator um, off of some data that we had where pine straw had been collected for um, longleaf pine sites. We're going to look at demands and preferences of Alabama pine straw consumers and then the willingness of Alabama forest landowners to actually harvest straw for their property. And then kind of to wrap it up, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the economics of pine straw. So in 2011, Janice took um, some data that we had for pine straw yields on natural longleaf pine stands across the southeast. Um, and she, she developed a model, a formula, that you can use to kind of get some estimate of how much pine straw your property might be able to produce if you have longleaf pine. So she used the regional longleaf growth study. You can see the counties here in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida where the data came from. And so what they actually did is they had from 1993 to 1997, they collected pine straw yields off of over 200, just over 200 plots. And so we took that data, that data had just been kind of sitting around, and Janice had this interest in this. So she took the data and um, she started looking at it. She started to look at what is it that impacts pine straw yield. And here's what she found. She found that for naturally regenerated longleaf pine stands, um, the things that help you determine how many bales per acre per year you might be able to produce is basal area. And if you're not familiar with basal area, I have a... a handout on basal area if you want to know a little bit more about that. Um, the age of your stand, the site index or the site quality, that's how well it might grow. Um, those are the things that you need to put in there. So if you know the basal area of your forest and you multiply it times 1.266, you know the age of your forest and multiply it times negative 0.266. The site index times 1.228 plus 21.043. You put that into the, um, that formula, and that gives you an estimate of bales per acre per year. We also have a spreadsheet. If math is not your friend, that's okay. Um, it wasn't my friend for a long time either. Um, we have a spreadsheet where you can plug the numbers in, and it will give it'll output your bales per acre per year that you can um, potentially produce. Um, this, for, this right here says R squared of 68%. All this really means is that, you know, essentially these variables here account for almost 70% of, of this number. So 
But this was kind of her best model that she found. We have a separate model just for Alabama that, again, I'm, I can help give you that number, too, give you that formula, too. We have that as a spreadsheet as well. So if, you, if you're interested, just let me know. But this works. What we found is her data set was within these parameters. But we found that it works for planted pines pretty well, too. So if you have planted longleaf, it seems to work pretty well. But essentially, we were looking at stands that had 30 to 151 square feet of basal area, were between 18 and 40 years old, had a side index between 56 and 79, and then had between 50 and 1,400 trees an acre. So we were looking at a wide variety of, of different plots that this data came from. And if you have um, questions about that, I'm happy to help you with it um, later on as well. What's side index? So side index is essentially, I have, a, I have a publication on that too if you have questions. Side index is essentially how you think, how your forest is going to grow through time. It deals with site quality and it's tied to the height of your tree because the height of a tree is, is very closely tied to um, the quality of the soil, the quality of the growing condition. And essentially what side index does is it tells you kind of that growth trajectory through time of how your forest stand may grow. And so you can actually, this is a series of curves, it's a graph, and so you can take, you know, how old your tree is and how tall your tree is, and you can find your point on the graph and you can find side index. Yes, sir? Is that, is that side index base year 25? 50. Okay. Yeah, base, base age 50. It's down low, you probably couldn't see it on the back there. But, um, yeah, so it is base age 50. And that's because Longleaf, a lot of the um, growth and yield models are base age 50 for site index. Just because you have a longer rotation age. Um, the second piece of Janice's project was she started looking at pine straw buyers, the folks who buy and sell pine straw. What are they looking for in there? And so she looked at the six metro regions in the state of Alabama and she talked to retailers, landscape contractors, lawn maintenance specialists and asked them what do they look for when it comes to pine straw. And what's really interesting is she asked them, so what type of pine straw do you buy? And nearly 20% of them had no clue. And a lot of them said, we really don't care. We just want to be able to sell it, and we want to be able to sell it cheap. And we want to turn over a lot of bales of pine straw. Um, and they were counting on the fact that most landowners don't know what the pine straw is either. Um, but then about 40% said they would rather have longleaf pine straw. Longleaf pine straw is really um, the, the pine straw to get. It has this nice color. It keeps its color a lot longer. It has that nice kind of golden brown color. Looks really nice against the green grasses and green shrubs. It really makes them pop visually. And then also it's got that waxier coating on the needle because it is one of the more fire tolerant species. So because it's evolved that way, the um, needles last longer. So you put them out there and that pine straw for a long leaf is going to last a lot longer than that for a log while you're slash. Slash is kind of your next best bet. Again, a little bit more waxy. Needles aren't quite as long and don't lay together quite as well, but it does hold up better than lob lolly, which about a quarter of the um, folks said that they they usually sold or purchased lob lolly pine straw. Um, lob lolly pine straw, unfortunately, tends to kind of turn more gray as it ages um, and can be really brittle and tend to break if it sits, especially if it sits in the truck very long waiting to be purchased. Um, then we ask them, you know, where does your pine straw come from? How far away does it come before it gets to you? Again, a lot of them didn't know. Um, but one of the telling things, too, is about a third of the respondents got their pine straw from more than 150 miles away. Um, that's definitely something I've seen. You know, you go up and down the interstates and there's lots of uh, pine straw semi-trucks full of pine straw from Florida and Georgia that are traveling through our state. So that's something, again, there's a lot of opportunity to be a little bit more local with our pine straw. There's a lot of markets that are being fed from a long ways away. Um, and then we ask them, so when do you actually have the busiest time for when you sell pine straw? Um, the busiest months are the spring, as you can imagine. This time of the year, people are trying to revamp their yards. Um, the least busy months are in the winter, so the needle fall is usually highest in September, October, November. It's then raked in January, February, and then sold um, in the spring months and throughout the summer. And then we went ask about pine straw preferences as far as bale shape. 
Um, most of the time, the square bales were per, uh, preferred. These are the, the ones you see, again, Lowe's, Home Depot, other retail outlets. They, um, these are easier because it's easier to stack and get in a vehicle, get in a truck or a car. Um, they're about 25-ish pounds, so they're not too heavy to deal with. Um, about 53% percent um, preferred machine bailed, 20% um, hand bailed, and 27% had no preference. Um, a lot of what you get is hand bailed. And then twine overall was um, the bail binding material of choice. Um, when it came to pine straw characteristics, um, the things that were kind of most important were no weeds and briars, of course, no invasive species, anything like that. Um, no foreign materials or trash. Those were kind of the, the bigger things that were really important to them. No sticks, no cones, no trash, no weeds, no invasive species. So that's kind of where people were that actually sold the pine straw. So that, as a landowner, that should help you kind of think about how do you want, if you're thinking about pine straw harvesting, you know, things you need to consider. Do you want to do round bales? Do you want to do square bales? How do you want to do this? Um, and then we also talked to landowners. Landowners kind of in six, in, in six counties that surrounded those metropolitan areas, um, usually in or adjacent to the area where we talked to the, the pine straw retailers. And we asked them to tell us about were they interested in, in selling pine straw. Um, and about 60% of the pine straw, the pine forest owners in Alabama expressed at least some interest in harvesting pine straw. You can see 39% were not at all that interested, but everybody else was somewhat to, to moderately interested. The folks who were most interested in pine straw production were those that had larger acreages of pines, whether they be natural or planted, blah, blah, long leaf or slash. And a lot of them had used a consulting forester in the past 10 years, so that made you think that, well, they actually um, knew a little bit about forest management, were active forest managers. Um, and then a lot of times they lived outside the county where their forest land was. So that means they didn't necessarily live on the property where they were thinking about harvesting this pine straw. Um, we asked them, so what makes you not rape pine straw? What are your concerns about it? What information do you need? Um, a lot of it, the concern was with lack of market, lack of information, maintenance costs and investment costs up front, um, lack of cost share programs, lack of demonstration sites, um, some concern about competition between components, some concern about uh, site quality, wildlife habitat, that type of thing. Um, and then how do you get started? What equipment's needed? How does, how does this all work? No one was interested in, in concern about uh, uh, reducing the nutrients in the soil. That's one of the things that people do ask me about. Nobody really said that in the survey, mm -hmm. but one of the, that's one of the things people usually ask me about when they call me or email me and say, well, you know, I'm interested, but what about the loss of nutrients in the soil? And I've done a good bit of searching into this to find out what are those impacts when you rake. And one thing I tell people is, you know, I'm not assuming that you're going to rake it every year for 30 years. I'm assuming you may ray rake for a short period of time and then let the track rest, um, or you may rake every other year. There's different ways you can do it if you're concerned about it. The biggest issue I've found with the research that's been done, and a lot of it's been done by the Forest Service, like in Louisiana, um, they have found that the biggest issue is more soil moisture. <laughs> Because by the time the pine straw falls, it's kind of lost a lot of its nutrients that it, you know, nutrient capacity. So, and if you're burning regularly, you're going to be burning that off too. And if you're hand raking, you're not going to be taking all the straw off. And even machine raking, you're not getting everything. There's still some on, you know, pine straw that is left. It's not going to be completely clean. But the bigger concern, according by the research I found, is that again, it's uh, soil moisture and the loss of potentially of soil moisture and possibly some erosion, but really they didn't find as much of that as an issue. And they also looked at the growth um, rates for, for trees that had been raked and had not been raked. And as far as height growth, they didn't find anything, any difference. So. How often, if you have a, let's just say you have a 100 acre track along the, you need to burn it every now and then, often should you burn it 
when you're trying to break these bells. <coughs> That's what I'm going to talk about in a little bit, actually. But that's okay. one. Thing. No, no, no. It's good. Um, one of the things is that you, know, you do need to think about fire, and yeah. fire needs to be a part of it. One thing some of the studies we've got also showed that fire can actually kind of promote that needle cast. Yeah. You know, it kind of actually increases pine straw production in some ways. So, one of the things is a lot of people might want to burn it like the year before, and then have that needle cast, and then you can rake from there. And fire is actually going to be your friend when it comes to pine straw production because it's going to help you keep have a cleaner understory, get a lot of that brush and the woody debris out, and so you have a much cleaner raking surface. So fire is really something that you need to consider, or herbicides. Um, good question, thanks. So how much revenue is expected? Most people were willing to accept about 50 cents to a dollar per bale, which is kind of that going rate. Um, one person said they were willing to take 10 cents a bale. They obviously were not very informed about the market. Um, but that's the 50 cents to a dollar is pretty much the going rate of what a landowner might expect to get. Um, you know, we found that there was nothing significant between the willingness to accept um, the prices and landowner location, the species owned or the acreage owned. But so this kind of suggests that landowners are not well informed about the pine straw market. They, they had long leads, they didn't say they wanted more money than the people who had blah blah. blah. Um, but one of the things that we found that was interesting is those who live in the same county as, or as their land expected higher prices. And that, it, it makes sense because people who live on the property or live closer to their property are more really closely tied to their property. And they kind of have higher expectations for what they're going to get off of their land than a lot of times absentee landowners. Are. So that's that was not necessarily surprising. Um, so if you're thinking about getting started in pine straw production, um, you need to think about a few things. If you're thinking about considering this, you need to think about what species do you have now, what species do you want to have in the future. Do you have loblaw in slash? It doesn't mean you can't rip pine straw. You just need to understand you know what their production capacity is going to be. How does the land lay? Is it pretty gently rolling, where if you wanted to do mechanical harvesting, it would be an option. If it's steeper, then you might want to do hand raking. Um, you need to think about preparing the site. We're going to talk a little bit about the economics of this, because one thing is, is a lot of times we talk to folks who are like, I have this land and I want to rake pine straw, and you go out there and look at it, and it hadn't been burned, and it hadn't had herbicide, and it is a woolly mess. And so you're like, yeah, you could, but it's going to take some effort to get your understory in shape. It can be done, but it's not something that you can go out there and just say today, yes, I'm going to make pine straw. So that's something that we, you need to understand that it, it does take a little bit of work up front. Again, thinking about how are you going to rake it? Do you want to machine rake it? Do you want to hand rake it? Who are you going to get to rake it? Um, <coughs> how often do you want to rake it? Again, that's sort of up to you. Do you want to rake every year? Do you want to rake every other year? To fertilize or not to fertilize your trees. Again, we talked about that soil productivity. Um, long leaf really doesn't usually do very well with um, fertilization. It's a pretty efficient tree when it comes to it's really, like I said, it's adapted to those drier, rocky sites. So it doesn't necessarily need a lot of nutrients. It doesn't need a lot of fertilization. And I don't know if y'all have ever seen any of the pictures of those long leaf trees that have been fertilized and they start to twist and bend and then they hit the ground and they come back up, they just can't deal with it. They don't process all those additional um, fertilizers very well. That's why a lot of times the long leaf on old field sites look kind of weird because they've got these a lot of residual fertilizers and things in the soil and so they look kind of strange. Um, Lob on the other hand, is a nutrient hog. It takes a lot of nutrients to um, support itself, a lot of water, so you may need to think about or want to think about fertilizing your loblaw stands. Um, to burn or not to burn. Again, depend, species dependent in some cases. With loblaw, you, uh, you may not want to burn early on. Um, long leaf and slash, burning is definitely something you want to consider. <laughs> um, I have a publication and I have a few copies in the back. That's, um, it's an extension publication that we worked on that says harvesting pine straw for profit, questions landowners should ask themselves. Um, ACES, A-C-E-S dot E-D-U. Um, is the uh, Alabama Cooperative Extension System website, and we do have lots of publications out there for landowners and forest, free and forest management. But this is one, and that's ANR, that's our publication number 1418. ANR 1418 is the, the publication. It's just kind of things to think about if you're thinking about pine straw production. 
So kind of wrapping up, one of the things, again, people ask me about is the economics of it. Does it pay? And then also the thought of, gosh, I need to do all this herbicide work. Is it going to make it worth it for me? So I did some just kind of quick scenarios to show you examples of, of what um, might be an option. And so I went and I took some of our past, the cost of practices, I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with our publication on the cost of forestry practices in the southeast. Um, our, we're currently doing our, it's done every other year, we're collecting information right now. That's another publication we have out there called the cost of forestry practices in the southern forests. Um, so I took some of our examples of average prices for these. This, they're maybe different in your area than maybe more than maybe less. And again, these are a couple years old. But I looked at some example costs per acre. So saying that near zero when you start your um, site prep and planting, about $168 per acre for site prep, $165 to plant. Year three, a herbicide of $45. Um, an annual management fee of $17, that could be everything from road maintenance to boundary line painting to, to whatever. Um, land taxes of $325, again, that's just um, one, I don't have any sort of other taxes associated with it. And then I assumed at age 15, you have a thinning of $189 an acre. Um, age 25, another thinning where you got $384 an acre. And then a final harvest of $1089 an acre. Um, that's assuming about a load to the acre um, and looking at your timber, timber mark south prices per ton. So using this as kind of a, an example, I ran some scenarios and we have another, this is from another spreadsheet that we have that's available to you in a publication, I have a publication in the back, where you can actually put in your revenues and your costs and it can give you some idea of are you making money based on your alternative rate of return. So your alternative rate of return, in this case, I had a 4% rate of return. And essentially what that means is do you have other investment opportunities outside of forestry that you could make 4% on or better? And so if that's the case, if you have other investment opportunities where you can make 4% or better, then in this case, if it's red, it's not so good. If it's green, it's good. In this case, just this scenario, just kind of a typical too thin final harvest, um, <coughs> planting it, no other revenue, no, har no hunting leases or anything like that in there. Um, this is saying that your net present value per acre would be a negative $221. That means that looking at all your revenues and all your costs, taking them back and putting them on equal footing, it says giving you a negative $221. It's saying you should be better off. If you had somewhere else you could put your money, that's what you ought to do. Not what we as landowners really want to think about. <coughs> so, if, if it was giving a 4% a, a return, uh, uh, would that have been zero? Yes. Uh, instead of that negative yes. or something? Yes. Okay. And so where you can look at, I did another example, if you had a 2% rate of return. So if you had alternative, and 3% actually comes out positive too when I ran the scenario. So if you had a 2% rate of return, um, just changing that interest rate, it gives a net present value of $45.89 per acre. So it's saying that you're good if you had just, if you had a, even a 3%, it came out positive. So if you had something that would be um, alternatives, you would less than 4%, then you're just as well off doing the forestry. Again, this is no other, um, if you can put hunting leases in there, that's a, a revenue opportunity to help you. And then we can also, it doesn't take into account any cost share or anything. So I ran an example with pine straw and herbicides. Because a lot of times people say, Becky, is it worth my effort to put in the herbicide work early on? Because they know that they need to control that understory so they have a nice clean area to, to rake the pine straw. Is it worth it? So I put in a herbicide treatment at three, six, and nine years at $45 a piece per acre, and then pine straw rake in years 10 through 15, getting $100 an acre, which is kind of the lower end of what most landowners can get. And with a 4% rate of return by just putting the pine straw in there and putting those herbicide treatments in there, it gives you a net present value of 1187 and so if you have a benefit cost ratio, that's your benefits over your costs. If it's around one, then it's a good investment. So this is 1.01. So even with a 4% rate of return, just by adding that pine straw in there, 
it makes it worth your while. The forest is in better shape. You're dealing with the, the understory, and you're um, from a forest aesthetic standpoint, you're better off too. So opportunities there just to add in those three, and why don't you wouldn't even need those three herbicide treatments, maybe just two. With a 2% rate of return, it's better, $354 per acre um, net present value. Better, even better if your rate of return is less. I looked at fire. I looked at prescribed fire and I looked at if you were like thinking the long leaf and you wanted to burn 3, 5, 7, 9, 12, you know, through the life of your stand. This is burning the entire life of your stand at $35 an acre. And then also the pine straw, just years 10 through 15. Um, if you had a 4% rate of return, it came up with a negative $112. And that's the, the cost of the fire in there. You might not burn that often, but that was burning every two to three years. At a 2% rate of return, it comes to a positive net present value of 169. Again, that's just pine straw. There's no hunting leases in there. If you put the hunting leases in there, that's going to help. Um, but just tell, this kind of just shows you that just forestry alone right now, because timber prices are really low, you can't, a lot of times, it's not the best option. So that's why so many landowners are coming to me saying, you know, we need to find something that we can do to help offset those costs. So finally, just to kind of wrap it up, I know I'm the thing standing between y'all and lunch. Um, <laughs> and y'all being very sweet, I really appreciate it. Um, but the potential drawbacks, so we've talked about a little bit of those. Beyond the cost and, you know, kind of the thinking about it from that standpoint, we talked a little bit about soil and water resources. There's some concerns. And if you rake intensively, I mean, some of the folks in southwest Georgia that are raking, they tell me, Becky, I'm not growing pine trees. I'm growing pine straw. And they rake the stink out of it. I mean, it's like a moonscape. It is clean under there. And that's like they are production basis pine straw production. Um, that's their choice. It's their property. It's their choice. Wildlife habitat is another thing that we tend to think about, and not a lot of work's been done. Cleaning up that understory and getting rid of a lot of the woody vegetation is really good for a lot of species. It's good, actually, for deer because you promote, because the vines and things aren't as big of a problem. Um, you promote the grasses, which are really good. You think about promoting quail habitat, turkey habitat, things like that. This open, more open understory is really positive. One thing we don't have a good understanding on is like herptifauna, lizards, things like snakes, things like that. It is more open. But one thing is, is you're raking a lot of times in the winter when those animals are hibernating anyway. So, um, but we don't have a lot of good research on that piece of it. But there are a lot of potential benefits. Um, I think one of the things that's really a good possibility is to actively manage lands after CRP program contracts expire. You've got this opportunity, and a lot of owners <coughs> I know are saying, my CRP is going to expire. I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's a way to kind of keep some revenue opportunities there. So I think the time's right to consider responsible management of non timber forest products like pine straw. Pine straw is just one of those non timber forest products we talked about before. Um, and this is a fellow that I've worked with in Jake in Georgia. He's actually going to be here next weekend at, at our um, conference on silvopasture and agroforestry. This is his longleaf pine silvopasture. This was several years ago. Um, when it was about 11 years old, he was in the process, he was going to have to thin it, but he started raking pine straw, and he had folks come to him and say, hey, you know, we want to rake your pine straw. He's actually getting around the big, like closer to 40-pound bales of pine straw of his um, forest. And what he was doing is he had cows in his silver pasture. Um, so he had the revenue from the cows. The cows would actually graze during the summer, and then he'd pull the cows off in the fall, and the pine straw would fall. He was looking at putting chickens out there so he could have chickens in the chicken tractors that would actually break up the cow pats. He actually went to the extension office and was asking them about dung beetles. They said they thought he was nuts and asked him, why are you thinking about dung beetles? He's like, I want something that's going to break up those cow pats and, and help move them along so that when my pine straw falls in the fall, then in January, February, I'll have clean straw that we can rake. Um, and the folks came to him about raking. They approached him about raking it. And they said, um, they said, you know, we'll give you 75 cents a bale for your pine straw. And he's like, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to take less than a dollar for my pine straw. And they're like, deal. And he said, that was awfully quick. <laughs> and so then he finds out later, you know, they're, they're bailing. The first year they bailed, they got about 100 bales to the acre. 
Um, it's gone up to now they're getting close to 150 bales to the acre. And again, there are these really large um, bales. This is longleaf straw. He lives again, like I said, in southwest Georgia. And uh, he said he felt really good about his dollar to the acre for his three-year contract. And then he found out that they were selling them on the outside wholesale for $7 a bale. He's like, Becky, I should ask for more money. Um, but he said, he's one of the people that I've talked to. He's like, I'm growing pine straw. Yeah, I, he said, I'll make more money off of this than I'll ever make off of my trees. And plus, he has the added benefit of having his cattle. Um, so he has multiple income streams off of one piece of property. So again, um, you know, I think it's really, it's definitely an option. It's something that people should think about. It's not for everybody. You need to really consider the economics. Is it going to be right for you? Is it right for your objectives? Um, and I think you just really need to understand the ecology and management of your forest, your forest trees, um, and that really can impact your land management decisions and what you want to do.